In this video, we are building an AI system that can detect and segment football players directly from real game footage. We will look at how the algorithm works end to end, how to prepare a dataset and train models like these, and we will also do a deep dive into the core deep learning model used in this project, the UNET architecture. Go hit that like button right now because it really helps the channel grow. We also have YouTube membership options and a Patreon page. Members and patrons will get access to all of the models, code, animation, slides, documents, and exclusive content that did not make it into the main video. So if you're interested, go check out the link below. Welcome to Neural Breakdown. Let's get started. So the heart of this system is the unit model that does image segmentation. And we are going to discuss the details of that a bit later, but for now just imagine it as a neural network that takes one single image of a football field as input, say of shape 256 by 256, and then outputs another 256 by 256 segmentation mask telling us where the players are. Each pixel in this mask is a probability distribution with a value between 0 and 1. If a pixel has high value, close to 1, it means that the network thinks it's likely to be a player pixel. And if it's close to 0, it means it detected a background. And of course, to train a machine learning model, first we need data. I downloaded this nice data set from Kaggle that has like 512 annotated images from a football game. Now this is not a large data set at all for a deep learning model. And there is a risk of overfitting the model when we train on small data sets like these. To avoid this, I use data augmentation techniques to artificially inflate the dataset. Instead of training on the entire image, I trained on multiple cropped out versions of the image with randomly adjusted zoom, randomly flipped, random rotations, and even perturbing the brightness and contrast. And all these augmentations can be pretty easily done with a Python library like Albumentations, and it drastically increases the dataset's perceived length. And once we have the data ready, we will now train the unit model to learn the mapping between the input images and the annotated segmentation maps. In the beginning of training, the unit outputs nonsensical segments, but as we optimize the loss between its latest predictions and the ground truth annotations, the network weights slowly produces more accurate segmentation maps. As per the loss function, I use a combination of the dice and focal loss. The dice loss is a metric that measures the overlap between the predicted and the ground truth masks. The formula is like this and to code it in PyTorch, it is pretty straightforward as well. The intersection component measures where both the prediction and the ground truth was one and the union is where either of them were one. On the other hand, the focal loss is a modified version of the standard cross entropy loss, where we downweigh easy examples and focus instead on predicting the hard examples correctly. The hardness itself is determined through a modulating factor denoted in the code as pt, which is obtained by measuring how high the cross entropy loss is at a given pixel. The higher this loss is, we will weigh the contribution of that pixel more when doing the gradient update. Intuitively, this encourages the network to learn better boundaries and localize objects more accurately, since generally the boundary pixels are where the loss will be the highest and therefore the focal loss will be the highest. And combining both the dice and focal loss enhances the model's ability to accurately segment images by considering both the spatial agreement as well as pixel-wise classification. And after enough training, we can see that the loss is going down. And I also recorded the images of the test set after each epoch to see if the model is actually learning anything. And I was pleasantly impressed. So we trained an image segmentation model, but during inference, we need to segment entire videos instead of a single frame. Using a Python library like CV2, we can extract individual frames from the video and send them to the unit for batch predicting the segmentation masks independently for each frame. And after the segmentation is done, we can concat them and do some fancy image post-processing steps to overlay the predicted mask on top of the input video. And voila, we got ourselves some segmentation video goodness. In this next section, let's talk about the unit model specifically in more detail. The unit is a type of fully convolutional neural network or FCNN. FCNNs are confnets that output images of the same shape or dimensions that it received as input. At a very high level, the unit model uses convolutional layers to downscale the original image into smaller feature maps and then upscale it back to the shape of the original image. And during upscaling, they also use skip connections that directly use the intermediate feature maps from the downscaling phase. If you want to take a fresh and unique visual perspective of how convolutional neural networks work, pause this video right now and go watch the previous video where I visualize just how a CNN really works. 
But if you're already caught up and you have already watched that video, let's talk about the unit with a very simple example. Say you got an input RGB image of shape 64 by 64 times 3. A convolution layer will downscale this image to say 32 by 32 times 16. 32 by 32 is the dimensions of each feature map and 16 is the number of channels. In PyTorch, we can do this with a conf 2D layer by setting the input channel to 3 and the output channels to 16. And for downscaling, we set the stride to 2. By doing strided convolution, it means that the network learns its own weights for the downscaling, making it a little more expressive versus using a fixed parameter-free function like max pooling to do the downscale. Back to the architecture, the unit continues to downscale to 16 by 16 times 32, followed by 8 by 8 times 64. All these 64 new 8 by 8 smaller image capture some high level features of the original input image. To code this, we can simply loop over our channels list, which in this case was 3, 16, 32, 64, and initialize the conf 2D layers procedurally. And then in the forward function, we receive the input image and pass it through each layer sequentially. After downscaling the images, UNET will now begin to upscale them. I use the PyTorch function upsampling nearest 2D, which just duplicates each value of the image from the nearest pixel. So from an 8x8x64, we scale up to a 16x16x64 16 16 feature map. And then we pass it through another standard conf2d layer with the output channel 32 and stride equal to 1 to convert it into a 16 by 16 by 32 feature map. After upscaling, we will also concatenate the 16 by 16 by 32 feature map from the downscaling stage to this new output, making it a 16 times 16 times 64 sized feature map. Unit repeats this process a couple of more times, going from 16 by 16 to 32 by 32, all the way back to 64 by 64, which was the original dimension of the input image. This skip connection operation is what makes Unit really special, and we will discuss the massive advantages this brings in a minute. But to code this, we once again use our channel list to initialize all of the convnets, and then inside the forward function, we simply loop over all of the blocks, upsample, call the conv layer and finally concat the corresponding downscaling tensor and repeat the process. The last layer outputs just one channel and we apply the sigmoid operation to convert it into a probability distribution between 0 and 1. As discussed earlier in the video, we use the dice and focal loss to optimize this output to predict the correct segmentation masks. So that's the basic structure of a unit, but there are a lot of other improvements I made on top of this basic architecture. If you're a member of the channel or a supporter in Patreon in the Neural Programmer tier, along with all of the animations and slides of this video, you will also get access to the code and a detailed walkthrough. So what is the point of the unit model? Well, unit has the same advantages as a traditional coordinate. Feature locality, parameter efficiency, translation invariance, concepts that we have already talked about in the last video. But on top of that, UNIT also introduces its own special inductive biases that make it even more awesome at image-to-image -image translation tasks. The skip connections in the UNIT allows the network to do feature reuse, an ability where UNIT can build off new features in the second stage uh, off of existing features that it already learned in the first downscaling stage of training, instead of learning the upscaling features from scratch. Skip connections also act like uh, residual connections because it forms these shortcut paths from the output straight to the input. And this makes it great for robust training and addressing gradient vanishing issues, especially in really deep convolutional neural nets. I've also seen some people confused between the autoencoder and the unit. Both of these architectures downscale and then upscale the input, but there are some important differences that comes because of those skip connections. In autoencoders, the encoder and decoders are kind of separate entities that are only connected to each other at the very middle. So we can input the latent space directly into a standalone autoencoder decoder and reconstruct the original input. And this allows the encoders in autoencoders to be independently used for compression and latent embeddings, whereas the decoders to be independently used for generative purposes. However, you cannot have a standalone unit decoder since the upscaling layers need information from the downscaling sections, making it a conjoined architecture. It can learn spatially hierarchical features through its two separate expansion and contraction parts without the information bottleneck that autoencoders impose. The lower resolution feature maps at the bottom capture very high level globally relevant attributes of the image, whereas the feature maps at the shallow layers of the network capture more lower level information like specific edges and specific clusters. 
And because we combine both the low resolution stuff and the high resolution stuff together during the upscaling part, we effectively get the best of both worlds. I had a lot of fun as I was working on this weekend project. Having a larger, more diverse annotated dataset would definitely drastically improve the current model. The current training dataset only has like 512 frames and they're all from the same game in the same camera angle. So there's definitely a lot of room for improvement. And with a larger dataset, we can also do more complex models like a sequence dependent unit model that looks at a sequence of images instead of just one single frame to generate those segmentation masks. And we can also extend the capability of the base model by pairing it with a player classification model to identify individual players in the field. Or we can track densities of the segmentations across the time axis to track each player as they move across the field. But all that is for a separate video. And thanks for making it till the end. You are magnificent. And a special shout out to all of my patrons and YouTube members. Thank you.